All right, so here we are. We're back here on South Beach again. Last week we did our special Palm Sunday teaching. We are a week later, the Saturday before Resurrection Sunday, also known as Easter in uh, many parts of the Christian world. And the reason we don't use Easter is because it's the English version of the term Ishtar, which was the fertility goddess that opposed the nation of Israel in the Bible. Ishtar, Astarte, Astaroth, all relate to the term Easter, which is why we refer to tomorrow, which will be Sunday, as Resurrection Sunday. So last week we did Palm Sunday. Uh, if you haven't already, like and subscribe on YouTube. The YouTube algorithm works really well when you guys go out there, you like and click on the video, make a comment. It sends the video to so many more screens so you are participating in getting the gospel out to the world just by going on YouTube and clicking a couple of buttons. So anyway, we are picking it up where we left off. Last time we had Jesus riding into Jerusalem on a donkey fulfilling Zechariah chapter 9 verse 9 where it says the king of Israel will come humble, meek, and lowly riding on a baby donkey. And so when Zechariah wrote that five centuries before the birth of Christ, he had no idea what he was writing about, but the Holy Spirit told him to do it, so he wrote it down. And the whole reason that was done was so that there would be an unmistakable sign that Israel would not be allowed to miss by God himself. Because remember, he had also, at about the same time as Zechariah was being a prop the nation of Israel, um, the Babylonian captivity was coming to an end. Daniel, who had been taken captive in uh, Babylon, was raised up to be a great leader in the land of Babylon. But God also sent the messenger angel Gabriel to him and gave him a vision of the 70 weeks prophecy. And remember, it was both prophetical and chronological years. So 70 times 7 gives you a total number of 490. We looked at that real quick and we saw that those 490 prophetic years will be divided out into two portions. The first 483 years or the first 69 weeks of years. Remember that there's seven days in a week then there's also going to be seven years in a week of years. So the first 483 of those years, or the first 69 weeks of years, would lead up to a very special point in time. And that special point in time we found out was none other than the very first Palm Sunday. Nisan 10 of 32 AD was the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem, guess what, on a baby donkey, consistent with Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, which was this super sign that the nation of Israel was supposed to recognize to realize that God had sent their Messiah and their king into Jerusalem to be accepted by the people. But of course, that didn't happen, right? But God knew that was going to happen. And so Israel was given no excuse because they had been told basically 483 years in advance to the day, the day that the king of Israel, the Messiah, would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. And so that the people and the religious leaders of the nation of Israel wouldn't miss it, Jesus arranged to have a baby donkey borrowed so that he could ride in Jerusalem to do that. So, again, the Bible is amazing. And the reason why Nisan 10 was so important, we looked last time, at the fact that it was laid out in Exodus chapter 12 and Exodus chapter 13 that during the very first Passover celebration, the very first Passover occurred at the end of the 400 year captivity in Egypt for the nation of Israel. When God said, bring a baby lamb into your house and on Nisan 10, you put it in your house and keep it for four days up to Nisan 14 and then on Nisan 14, you slit his throat, you bleed the blood out into a bowl and then you paint it on the door of your house in the sign it turned out of a cross. So you put it there, there, and there on the door and the blood would drip down and it would form a cross. And so my good friend Julia Bonner, who was a former uh, trial team partner of mine when we were at the state attorney's office here in Miami together, she asked the question because she's raising up her little son Jack and he's you know becoming a little Bible scholar and he was like, Mommy, why is there blood involved? What's the whole point of the blood? And we kind of explained that. And the point is that we learned in Hebrews chapter 10 it is that says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. And so God requires blood because what? We learn from scripture, 
life is in the blood. To the extent that Adam, the first man, condemned the whole human race by what? Listening to the voice of his wife as opposed to the voice of his God, which then caused the curse of sin to be born in his body and passed on biogenetically and psycho spiritually to each one of his descendants, the children of men, the descendants of Adam and Eve, all have inherited that sin curse gene. And it's the shedding of the blood, the sacrificing of a life that is required to pay for the price of Adam's sin. Adam was alive when he sinned and he committed a sin against a living God that's eternal and so no single man could pay that price, right? So the human race is in a problem. You know, Adam, who was the father of the whole human race, condemned the whole human race by listening, like I said, to the voice of his wife in opposition to the voice of his God and committing the first sin so that all of his descendants are born in that sin. But God, in his infinite love and mercy, provided a way out by creating and providing for a second man who scripture refers to as the last Adam and we find out that that's Jesus Christ and we found out again through Exodus 12 and 13 that we're Passover uh, ceremony and this year Passover and Resurrection Sunday or which some people call Easter is separated by several weeks uh, last year it was right in the same weekend so many years it's the same weekend so sometimes Passover is conflated with or confused with Resurrection Sunday and the springtime fertility goddess ritual known as Ishtar, the Feast of Ishtar or Easter, um, which was celebrated at the time of Jesus. And you see that referred to in the book of Acts when you know they were going to kill Peter, remember? And they said, well, let's wait until after Easter. And some people say, well, the King James Version is wrong because it used the word Easter and it shouldn't use the word Easter uh, because Easter wasn't celebrated as the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And it's accurate because that was making reference to what the Romans, who were pagans, acknowledged. That springtime fertility goddess ritual known as the Feast of Ishtar or Easter in English was in existence at the time of the book of Acts. And so the King James Version of the Bible is the correct and accurate version of the Bible because it uses the word Easter correctly. Was not referring to Passover because the Romans didn't care about Passover. They cared in the book of Acts for the sacrifice of Peter about that feast that the pagans, the non-Jewish people would be celebrating. So again, that's an aside. But again, we have Exodus 12 and 13, the Passover, um, is instituted when the lamb is brought into the house on Nisan 10, is examined to make sure it's perfect and no blemishes. And then on Nisan 14, just before sundown, it's sacrificed. The blood is spilled out, placed on the door of each house in the form of a cross. And scripture says, and when the destroyer comes through the land of Egypt that night, I will see the blood and I will pass over you and not come in to destroy you. So that was instituted as a ceremony that the Jewish people to this very day keep as a memorial, because scripture said keep it as a memorial. Remember what God did. God supernaturally saved Israel from the Egyptian captivity and led them out and part of the Red Sea. Remember, it was like a mile of water on the left-hand side, a mile of water on the right-hand side. Israel passes through, and when Pharaoh and his armies tried to come through after them, God collapses millions of pounds of water on them, destroys them, and you got the chariot wheels and, and the remnants of that event still at the bottom of the Red Sea to this day. You know, there's a video out there. You can see a submarine went down and took pictures of it. And what all that points out is that the Bible is a supernatural book. Today's teaching, what you see in the title, is making reference to what? The Thursday crucifixion of Jesus of Nazareth and his resurrection, because tomorrow's Resurrection Sunday. So again, the Thursday crucifixion, and that's important, by the way, because yesterday, you know, uh, you know, here in Miami and, you know, throughout the United States, things tend to shut down and even buses run slower, some businesses close early, banks close early, because it's Good Friday, right? Because Good Friday became a tradition that, again, was superimposed upon the church by individuals who probably well-meaning and the Catholic Church certainly has promoted that whole concept of Good Friday and not eating meat on Friday and all these sacraments that have nothing to do with Scripture but you couldn't have 
the required, and remember, looking last week at Palm Sunday, we saw that God was exacting to the very day. And Sir Robert Anderson, a mathematician, born-again believer, and an investigator for Scotland Yard in England, did all of the mathematical homework for us so we don't have to, and was able to confirm, in fact, that that very first uh, you know, Palm Sunday, 483 years later, you know, earlier, was the day that our Xerxes Longimanus gave a specific decree that's made reference to in the Bible so that we know that the prophecy was fulfilled after almost 500 years to the very day, and that day was Nisan 10 of 32 AD. And we know it was 32 AD, and we know that the Bible is perfectly accurate it's because four days later, Jesus was crucified consistent with the Roman decree that he should be put to death and in that case put to death before the Passover. So remember, and we're going to look at, you know, the Gospel of John does the best job of all of the four Gospels in laying out the specifics of when that Passover uh, crucifixion was or that pre-Passover crucifixion occurred. Remember, the Last Supper that we are going to look at very quickly was not the Passover. Jesus couldn't eat the Passover. Why? As Dave Hunt has pointed out in his brilliant Bible prophecy teaching before he went home to be with the Lord, Jesus was the Passover, right? Remember in Exodus chapter 12 and 13, the little baby lamb that gets brought into the house on Nisan 10 and is observed to make sure it has no flaws or blemishes for four days and then is sacrificed at just before sundown on Nisan 14 is then cooked and eaten that night as the very first Passover. So remember in, in the Jewish parlance, the, the next day starts when the sun goes down. So at about 6 p.m., it's Nisan 14, and then by 7 p.m., when you're sitting down to eat dinner, that little lamb that got cooked up is now being eaten on Nisan 15, which is the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, or the Passover. And so that's what happened in Egypt. It's been celebrated since Moses was chosen by God to lead Israel out of Egypt. But when Jesus came along, he made clear that what was going to be celebrated, that Nisan 15 in 32 AD, was a Passover that was a representative of what he was going to do the day before on Nisan 14, which was become the Passover lamb. So the Last Supper, again, just like Good Friday is a problem, because scripture says what? There must be three days and three nights in the grave. Because remember when Jesus asked for a sign, was asked for a sign like perform a magic trick and prove that you're the Messiah. And Jesus said no sign is going to be given to you unbelievers except the sign of the prophet Jonah. And in the Old Testament, Jonah, who was being sent to Nineveh to preach repentance, you know, from, from the Lord, and he didn't want to do it because he didn't like those people. They were cruel and evil, and so he decided not to follow what, the instructions that God had given him as, as the prophet of God, and so God had him swallowed up by a whale, and he was supernaturally kept alive in the belly of the whale for three days, and then vomited up on land right on the shore of Nineveh so that we would learn that when God gives his prophets, his teachers, his preachers, a message, we are not under uh, or, you know, authorized to change it or twist it or turn it in any way. And so you see all these TV evangelists on television that create the prosperity gospel and all these different types of different gospels, man, they're going to be in trouble because God, you know, just like he did with Jonah, he kept him three days and three nights in the belly of the whale and then vomited him up on lands. Jonah got the message. But the point that we're learning is that when Jesus said the only sign that's going to be given to you is the sign of the prophet Jonah, just as Jonah spent three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so must the Son of Man spend three days and three nights in the heart of the earth after he's crucified, right? And so Jesus himself said the Messiah, the blood sacrifice for God, has to spend three days and three nights in the grave and then the resurrection would occur you cannot get three days and three nights from a friday crucifixion to a pre sunrise resurrection and tomorrow's sunday and so you know sometimes you have those sunrise services 
that's not biblically accurate because he didn't rise with the sun. He rose before the sun. So when the sun rose, he was already out of the grave. So you couldn't get three days and three nights between a Friday crucifixion at any time of the day on Friday and a pre-sunrise resurrection on the following Sunday. You wouldn't be able to do it. So again, let's be biblically accurate. So what we promote is what's consistent with all of the mathematical computations of Sir Robert Anderson in that book we looked at last week, The Coming Prince, that it was a Thursday crucifixion, that the last supper that Jesus celebrated with his disciples was not the Passover, but what it's in essence Christmas Eve, the preparation for the Passover, the night before the Passover, when you're making ready and preparing for the stuff that would happen the next day. And we're going to take a look at the Gospel of John and, and prove that out. And so, again, tomorrow, the resurrection day, what's the point of it? What's the whole point, as little Jack asked, you know, Julia's son, what's the whole point of all this blood and all, it, it just seems, what's going on? And we know that from scripture in Hebrews 10, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins, but we know that the blood of bulls and goats and animals can only be a symbol or a type or a shadow of the blood sacrifice that's required because Adam wasn't an animal, Adam was a man. So the blood sacrifice for it to be fair, just and equal has to be a man. But because the sin that Adam committed in the garden was against an eternal being, God, that sin or that penalty must be an eternal penalty. He must be forced to pay it back forever, which means that we would be separated from God forever in hell if God wasn't loving, just, and merciful. In, a, in, in addition to being just, he's also merciful, and thank goodness for that. So he makes a substitutionary sacrifice. No son of Adam could ever play the role of the Passover lamb, which again we see uh, Sir Robert Anson laid out for us, occurs in that sacrifice on Nisan 14 because four days after the first uh, Palm Sunday on Nisan 10 just before the Passover celebrated on the evening of November uh, Nisan 15 you have all the Passover lambs brought to the temple towards the end of the day on Nisan 14 and then they're ritualistically sacrificed at the temple and the blood is poured out just before sundown. So at the same time Jesus is hanging up on the cross from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. the Passover lambs are being brought to the temple to be ritualistically sacrificed and their blood poured out at the temple was just a few you know a uh, hundred yards away. So God made it super clear for us. So anybody that missed it missed it because they didn't want to see the truth. And so when Jesus is taken down Sometimes, you know, there, there's a mistake made and the Catholic Church promotes that idea that Jesus was taken down because the Passover or the Sabbath was beginning. And because that verse says the Sabbath was about to begin, individuals have conflated or misconstrued that to mean the regular Saturday Sabbath. But the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the first day of which is the Passover, is in fact also known as a special Sabbath. So when you start the Feast of Unleavened Bread with Passover, that's considered a special Sabbath. That's a special day of rest that's appointed. And just like Christmas falls on a different day of the week, it's a Saturday one year and the next year it's going to be Sunday and then the next year it's going to be Monday and it'll be Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday throughout the seven day calendar, the Passover would fall just like that. It would change each year. And so in Nisan, excuse me, in 32 AD, Nisan 10 fell on a Sunday, Nisan 14 fell on a Thursday. And guess what else happened? On Nisan 14 and 32 AD, you know, we've been able to check the archaeological and, you know, astronomical charts, and guess what? There was a solar eclipse, not in 31 AD, not in 33 AD, but in 32 AD on Nisan 14, there was a solar eclipse. And guess what? The Bible makes reference to it. When Jesus was being hung on the cross from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m., what we had happen at 12 noon was what Arthur Kessler, a famous writer, you know, made a reference, wrote a book. The book wasn't about Jesus, but he stole the title from the crucifixion of Jesus from the gospel, and he named that book uh, Darkness at Noon. 
by Arthur Kessler. Darkness at noon is a reference to the fact that at 12 noon, when the sun is the highest point in the sky, and it should be as you know bright as it's ever going to be during the day, at noon it became totally dark. Why? Because it was at that point, at the 12 noon point, when the wrath of God fell down upon Jesus and he became the blood sacrifice Passover lamb that is sacrificed you know on Nisan 14 and his blood is poured out and some have suggested you know some theologians and some Bible teachers that it was such a dark moment in human history and in the history of the universe that God turned the lights out so that the universe would not witness what God would do to his very own son who was sin free but became the substitutionary sin sacrifice for us and so as I pointed out before because Adam was a man the Passover lamb the final substitute also had to be a man but because the sin was committed against an eternal God then the individual that's being sacrificed would have to be sacrificed eternally unless he was also God and an eternal being, which is why Jesus had to be the Passover lamb and no other man, no matter how righteous or nice or kind or sin free he could be, he's not an eternal being. And so Jesus would have to both be a real man to be a substitute for Adam, but he would also have to be God for his one time sacrifice to be equal to an eternity of suffering in the lake of fire by a human being, which is what will happen to anybody that rejects the sacrifice that Jesus has made for us. Nobody has to go to hell. Everybody that goes there is going to go because they choose to. God bless. God bless. Thank you, guys. Um, you know, uh, so anybody that goes there is going there because they've chosen to reject the free gift of eternal life that Jesus purchased for us by not just being hung up on the cross, Dave Hunt makes a great point. He says it wasn't the, the Roman nails put through his hands and his feet that was the shocking, horrifying, terrible thing that Jesus was facing when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane after the Last Supper, which was the Christmas Eve meal, that is to say the preparation for the Passover meal that he celebrated with his uh, disciples. When he went into the Garden of Gethsemane, he was so terrified, frankly, uh, as to what was coming, that he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. And that's a, a medical condition called hematidrosis. When your heart rate or your blood pressure gets so high, the pressure of the blood being squirted through the little blood vessels, and especially the capillaries towards the surface of the skin, becomes so great that they burst like a pipe that gets over, you know, frozen and then filled with water. The pipes can burst. That's what happened to the capillaries in the skin of Jesus. He became so stressed out, so terrified by what was coming the next day that the capillaries in his skin burst under the pressure of his heart. You know, some people, most people die of a heart attack before the blood seeps out of the capillaries through the sweat glands and the pores of the skin. So you literally have circumstances where someone can sweat instead of uh, perspiration through the sweat glands the blood that spills out of the ruptured capillaries. But because that type of stress generally kills the victim before the blood can even seep out of the capillaries, you don't see it happening very often, but it does happen. And it's been medically uh, documented that hematidrosis, when someone becomes so terrified and so stressed out that they can actually sweat drops of blood. Again, that proves the Bible is written by God himself. It contains advanced medical information that other religious books don't have that is proven to be accurate centuries, even millennia later. So anyway, Jesus could not have been terrified of getting crucified by having nails driven through his hands and feet. You know, nobody wants to have that happen. And sure, I, if I knew it was going to happen to me tomorrow, I might be dreading that. But there were people, and Dave Hunt has pointed this out in many of his Bible prophecy books, that there were many people that hated the Romans so much that they would go to their deaths, gritting their teeth, not giving Rome the pleasure of seeing them cry out or beg for mercy. They would just say, to heck with you, grit their teeth, take the pain and die like a man, you know. There are tough guys that can do that, you know, quite frankly. So what's the likelihood that Jesus was so terrified of uh, getting uh, nails put through his hands and his feet that 
man, not only was he crying and, and afraid in the garden, but that he was so terrified that the blood vessels in his skin burst open. Impossible. He wasn't dreading the Roman crucifixion. He could have hung on the cross from that day until today if he had wanted to. It was the wrath of God that would result in us being separated from him in the lake of fire, tormented day and night forever. If you took day and night forever torment times however many people are born through the end of the end of the millennium, maybe 20 billion people, let's say, from Adam and Eve giving birth to the first sons, you know, uh, after being ex expelled from the garden through the last person born during the 1,000 year reign of Jesus Christ, the millennium, about 20 billion people, let's just guesstimate. If you took 20 billion eternities, day and night suffering forever and ever and ever times 20 billion and then melted it down to one six hour period of time that would be what Jesus experienced on that very first uh, you know Nisan 14 and 32 AD when the real Passover lamb was sacrificed that's what he was dreading in the garden of Gethsemane and so he paid for that and it was at 12 noon that the sun blacked out and again that was in Nisan 14, 32 AD, not 31 AD, not 33 AD. So that's how we know that Jesus was crucified consistent with the 69 weeks of Daniel prophecy and the 173,880th day after that decree of Artaxerxes Longimanus was in fact Nisan 10, the day that the Passover lamps for that year are to be gathered up and brought to the temple. And that's the day Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey. He couldn't come in on Nisan 14, right? Because under Exodus 12 and 13, you have to have the Passover lamb four days early so you can examine him to make sure he's, he's blemish free. In other words, sin free. And so Jesus, being the Passover lamb, did that very thing. Okay, so let's take a look real quick at the scriptures that relate to that Last Supper. Um, again, Daniel chapter 9, Verse 24 through 26 is what we made reference to about the Messiah being, uh, you know, after three score and two weeks, that is to say after the 69 weeks of years, Daniel chapter 9, verse 26, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. Again, that Hebrew word karat means killed, so we know that Daniel chapter 9, verse 26 says the Messiah has to come in, he has to be killed. Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9 says he has to come in on a donkey, lowly and humble, you know, and, and that's exactly what, what Jesus did. Again, so when you tie in together, rejoice greatly, uh, O daughter of Zion, it says, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Thy king cometh unto thee. He is just, sin free, that means, and having salvation. That means he must be the Messiah of God to replace the curse of Adam's sin lowly and riding upon an ass and upon the colt the foal of an ass now that's an odd thing for a king to be doing and we talked about how that was god's way of giving us and specifically the nation of israel a sign so obvious that if they missed it they'd be held responsible for it and when we looked last week at the gospel of luke's recitation of this triumphal entry uh so-called Jesus himself began to weep over the city and he said the reason why I'm crying isn't because I'm going to be crucified in four days. I'm crying because God told you guys 483 years in advance the day that I was going to come in to be received as king and because you've rejected me the temple's going to be destroyed. The Jews are going to be driven out of the land of Israel. And the diaspora occurred in 70 AD. The temple was destroyed the second time in 70 AD. Even though it was accidental by the Romans, God manipulated the circumstances that caused it to come true so that Bible prophecy could be fulfilled. And remember last week we talked about how the Roman fiery arrow was errant and it set a curtain on fire which set the cedars on fire inside the temple structure and it melted the gold sheeting on the walls and the gold ran down between the cracks so bad the Roman soldiers had to take the temple apart stone by stone to get to the million dollars in gold. So even though the Romans had no regard for the God of Israel or trying to fulfill Jewish prophecy, God made the Romans his foot servants in fulfilling prophecy literally because Jesus said because you've missed the 69 weeks of Daniel when I rode into Jerusalem on a donkey which you were supposed to know and 
because Daniel chapter 9 verses 24 through 26 gives you the specific day 483 years in advance that it was going to occur that you because you missed both of those obvious signs God says and Jesus said that you know not one stone would be left in the temple upon another that would not be thrown down and so of course it was 30 some odd years later when that prophecy came literally true when that's right 70 AD it says this young man right here he knows his scripture he knows that it was 70 AD when the temple was destroyed but not just destroyed taken apart stone by stone consistent with what Jesus had said 30 years later and you know he yesterday was supposed to be the sacrifice day Oh, so, 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 we don't oh, know if they did or not. now we got, we got, we got a visitor to Southeast Gospel. Say that again so that they can hear you, yeah, yeah, that yeah. the temple is going to be rebuilt with, soon. And there you go, guys. The yesterday, temple. Yesterday was supposed to be, yesterday was the, uh, um, Sabbat Parah, yeah. which is the Sabbath of the Red Heifer. Uh, see, and they and, were supposed to sacrifice it yesterday, so we don't know what they actually did yet. Now that's funny because I've been getting questions on YouTube all week about the red heifer and people saying, hey, what's your position on the red heifer and the temple being rebuilt? And I'm like, man, I'm get, I wonder why I'm getting all these questions from all the, from Australia, from Canada. People are wondering because what you just they, said. They can't rebuild it until they sacrifice. Oh man, how about that? And I even talked to Jews here who had no idea about the red heifer. Wow! Now the prophecy of the red heifer, man. You when That's you Old Testament. when you look in the book of Leviticus, just like we talked about how the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed on Nisan 10 or presented on Nisan 10 for four days and then sacrificed just before sundown on Nisan 14. The Bible is exacting. It has the same rules about the red heifer, which is sort of a cow with red hair. And that, they they had nine nine heifers from Moses until conveniently 70 AD. Wow, how about that? And 70 AD, as we've already pointed out, is the day that the temple was destroyed consistent with Jesus' prophecy related to that. Let's, I haven't had one in 2,000 years, and the Jews here have no idea that they had the red heifer. Wow, so let's take a look at John chapter 19. Or let's go to John 18, and we pick up that Thursday uh, is the day that the crucifixion occurs because we know that the Last Supper was just before the Passover would begin and, and John really does a good job of, of laying that out. In John chapter 18 verse 28 it says, Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas to the Hall of Judgment and it was early and they themselves went not into the Judgment Hall lest they should be defiled but that they might eat the Passover. The Passover wouldn't be until the next evening. So they didn't go into the judgment hall when Pilate put Jesus on trial because they would be defiled by going into the house of a Roman before the Passover. So we know that the Last Supper that Jesus had just celebrated with his disciples before his arrest was the preparation for the Passover, or other words, what we might call Christmas Eve for those that celebrated Christmas. The day before Christmas is Christmas Eve. This was Passover Eve that Jesus celebrated. As Dave Hunt pointed out, Jesus couldn't eat the Passover because Jesus was the Passover. So we go on a little bit further. And he said he won't drink again until he drinks the new Passover. And, there, and that's exactly what he said. And so then Pilate said, take him and scourge him and judge him according to yourself. And when we drop down to verse 39, Pilate says to Caiaphas and the others that were trying to uh, crucify him, he comes up with a plan to save Jesus after he examines Jesus. And so Pilate himself is talking to Jesus in the judgment hall, and he says, Pilate, verse 33, Pilate entered into the judgment hall and called Jesus and said to him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And Jesus basically said, that he is, and says, are you asking me of yourself, or did others tell thee? And he says, what? Well, Pilate says, am I Jewish? I mean, you know, the chief priest delivered me unto you. What, what have you done that causes the priest to want to have you condemned by a Roman? And Jesus tells Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews, but now is my kingdom not from hence. What Jesus is telling us is that the two comings of the Messiah is absolutely necessary. The second time he comes as the king of the Jews and will be 
established and set upon the throne of his father David on the Temple Mount. And that's why the temple, as we just discussed, has to be rebuilt so that Jesus can sit in there. But the first time that the Messiah came, he would have to come as what? The Passover lamb that has to be sacrificed on behalf not just of the nation of Israel, but on a on behalf of the whole human race, all of the children of men, sons of Adam, daughters of Eve, that are alive, need the substitutionary blood sacrifice that Jesus was able to provide. And remember, that's why God put a Gentile woman named Ruth, who was a Moabites, into the bloodline of King David, who was the progenitor of Jesus, so that a Gentile could have their DNA and their genetics in the bloodline of the Passover lamb. Because Leviticus says that it has to be a kinsman redeemer, a close blood relative, can redeem back that which was lost. We learned that from Leviticus chapter 25. But let's go back to the examination of Pilate and Jesus. And Jesus said, Thou sayest I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth, and everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. So Pilate... Goodness forbid, I had this debate with somebody. I wouldn't be surprised after the rapture occurs that we see both Nebuchadnezzar, the former king of Babylon, and maybe even Pontius Pilate himself in the kingdom of heaven with us because I believe that their approach, at least Pilate's approach with Jesus, was a lot more respectful than Caiaphas and Annas, the high priest and the former high priest. He seemed to know that there was something about Jesus that caused him to become the defense attorney for Jesus. So he ended up trying to get Jesus off the hook because his wife said, this man is just, I had a dream about him, don't have anything to do with, in other words, don't put this man to death. Now you can put to death whoever else you want, but not this guy. And so Pilate was trying to get Jesus off the hook, but Jesus wouldn't cooperate with him. And it was because Jesus knew he had to come to become the Passover blood sacrifice. And so we pick it up in verse 39 of John chapter 18. It says, Pilate is now talking to the Jews. He's trying to find a way to get Jesus out of the crucifixion. He says, well, you guys have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. So the Passover hasn't happened yet. Will ye that I release unto you the king of the Jews? And they cried not, asking for a Barabbas instead. And so we, we then move on to, you know, uh, John chapter 19. So Pilate has Jesus whipped in hopes that that will satisfy the bloodlust of Caiaphas and Annas and the religious elite that are trying to get rid of Jesus because they're worried about Jesus, you know, uh, bringing the real word of God to the people which will cause them to lose their authority and power over the people. We pick up this Thursday crucifixion now. These trials, by the way, all occurred at night, so they're all illegal trials under the law of Moses. If the Sanhedrin tries somebody for blasphemy, it has to be during the daytime, it has to be public. Jesus was tried six different times, and it was all at night, and they were all illegal. And so, Pilate it says, verse 1, John chapter 19, Therefore took Jesus and scourged him, and the soldiers platted a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe. The Roman pagans who worship Jupiter and Venus and Mars are being manipulated by God himself to do things that would be consistent with them believing in Jesus being the king of the Jews. Referring to him as the king of the Jews and putting a purple robe, which in Rome meant royalty, on Jesus is God's way of sticking it to the Pharisees who demanded that Jesus be put to death as a criminal by the Romans themselves acknowledging that Jesus was in fact a real king. And then Pilate said, as if to add insult to injury, said, Behold, I bring him forth to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Why is that important? It's important because Jesus, and as a, a former career prosecutor in three different states, for me, New York, New Jersey, here in Miami, I've done a bunch of murder cases, and I've done a bunch of criminal trials over the course of my career. And I've never in the history of the criminal justice system heard of an account where somebody was acquitted of a crime and then sentenced to death for it. Now you may have kangaroo court system in the former Soviet Union, maybe in communist China, where people will be falsely convicted with trumped up charges and trumped up false evidence, but they're 
officially convicted in the court, even if it's false evidence. This is the only time in the history of the planet Earth that I'm aware of that somebody was put on trial and found innocent, that is to say acquitted, and then sentenced to death. Why did that occur? That had to occur because according to the rules of God, the Passover lamb has to be blemishless. He has to not be guilty of a crime to be eligible to be the substitutionary blood sacrifice for Adam, the first man. The first man, the original Adam, is substituted out by what Paul refers to as the last man, the second, the second man, the last Adam. And so Jesus had to be sin free. So that was the whole point of Pilate putting him on trial and Pilate, a pagan enemy of Rome and the governor on behalf of the Roman Empire actually acquits Jesus and says he is innocent. And so he goes on to say, uh, verse 6, and when the chief priests therefore and officers saw him, they cried out saying, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, take ye him and crucify him for I find no fault in him. This is consistent with the fulfillment of the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 verse 26 that says that the Messiah is going to be presented at the end of the 69 weeks of Daniel on the 173,880th day, the conclusion of the 69 weeks of Daniel, and he is going to be put to death, but not for himself, Daniel tells us. What is Daniel talking about? In other words, he's saying that that sacrifice that's made is made for sins that he didn't commit. He becomes the substitutionary sacrifice. If I've got my own sin debt to pay for, which of course I do, I couldn't be a substitutionary sacrifice for you before God's eyes because I got my own sins to pay for, so why wind up in hell? It's because I deserve to be there. I can't go to hell on behalf of you. And Jesus had to be completely sin-free and innocent in order to be the second man, the last Adam, substitutionary Passover blood sacrifice because, and that's the whole reason for the weird four-day observation between Nisan 10 and Nisan 14. Nisan 14 is when you kill the lamb, put the blood on the door in the form of the cross, but you had to watch him for four days to make sure he was absolutely perfect and blemish-free. And so, so, so we see that then in, in John chapter 19. Um, let's pick it up at verse 12. It says, And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, thou art not Caesar's friend. So they were basically extorting Pontius Pilate into not letting him go, even though he had held a trial, found him innocent, because he was afraid they were going to report him to Rome as a traitor to Rome. Verse 14 tells us, It was the preparation of the Passover, and about the sixth hour, and he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. And they cried out, Away with him, crucify him. Pilate said unto them, Shall I crucify your king? Pilate's busting the chops of Caiaphas, Annas, and the religious elite of the nation of Israel that are orchestrating the condemnation of Jesus of Nazareth not because they really think that he's a criminal, but because they are threatened that he is bringing to the people the word of God and that the people are accepting him as the Messiah, which means that their political uh, authority and their power is threatened by Jesus. Verse 14, it says, and it was the preparation for the Passover about the sixth hour, that means 9 a.m. in the morning, and they cried out, uh, crucify him. And Pilate responds, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest says, we have no king but Caesar. And so it says after that, then they then delivered he him, therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. And so Jesus is now going to be crucified. And in John chapter 19, verse 31, we see clearly again that it's the Nisan 14 Thursday crucifixion of Jesus, not Good Friday, because you can't have three days and three nights between Friday and a pre-sunrise, pre-sunrise uh, Sunday. So verse 30, John chapter 19, when Jesus therefore had received his vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now remember, God has already blacked out the sun. The wrath of God has already fell, fallen on Jesus at 12 noon. Jesus says, you know, uh, you know, Father, why has, has thou forsaken me? 
you know, and he stops referring to God as his father, and then he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He had been referring to God the Father as his father, but at 12 noon, when the wrath of God falls upon him and the solar eclipse occurs, he now just refers to him by the title God because he's lost that intimacy because he's become sin. But in verse 30, he says to telestai in the Greek, which is an accounting term, which means paid in full, translated in English, it says, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Verse 31, John chapter 19 says, the Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation, the preparation for the Passover, which wouldn't begin for another couple of hours after sundown, that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day. That's not the Saturday Sabbath. That's why people make the mistake about Good Friday because they think at sundown Friday, when it goes over into darkness, it becomes Saturday, which is the Sabbath, the regular Saturday Sabbath. But we know from John chapter 19, verse 31, it's not talking about the Saturday Sabbath. They're talking about the special Sabbath. The special Sabbath is the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread or the Passover. It says, Verse 31, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, they besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. In other words, they wanted the bodies to be taken off the cross before the special Sabbath, which is the Friday Feast of Unleavened Bread, which was Nisan 15 of 32 AD. And that's when Jesus was taken down from the cross and the legs of the thieves were broken so that they would suffocate to death faster. And when they got to Jesus, they weren't allowed to break any bones on him, right? Because the Old Testament prophecies from several centuries earlier, specifically Psalm 22, which describes crucifixion in painstaking detail centuries before crucifixion was even invented as a form of execution or torture, it says not a bone of his body will be broken. That's another sign that proves that Jesus was in fact the Messiah. He had to jump through all of these different hoops. Even while he was dying, he wasn't allowed to die like the normal people who get crucified died. Why? So that none of us would have the excuse for missing out that this guy, Jesus, Israel's best friend who is also the king of Israel, but also the second man, the last Adam, the substitutionary sacrifice for the entire human race. And so tomorrow, when you get up and acknowledge that it's Resurrection Sunday, which again, in, in some parts of uh, Christianity or Christendom refers to as Easter. Don't use the term Easter. That's the Feast of Ishtar. You don't want to be giving glory to some fertility sky goddess that should belong to Jesus only. Tomorrow, you're going to remember that Jesus was the Passover blood sacrifice once for all time delivered by God to himself. Remember the Akedah, Genesis chapter 22, when Abram was going to sacrifice his son Isaac uh, on the little altar that was built and God stopped him and said, no, no, don't do it, Abraham. Uh, look over in the, in the bushes. There's a ram whose horns got caught in a thicket. Sacrifice that instead. And he, when Abraham did that, they renamed the place Jehovah Jireh, which is to say God will provide. In other words, God told Abraham, don't worry, Abraham, you don't have to sacrifice your son. The Lord will provide himself as the sacrifice. And that's how we know that the Jehovah's Witnesses are wrong. Jesus isn't the Archangel Michael. Jesus is God the Son, God in human flesh, the second person of the Trinity that's superimposed on Scripture so that he could be the blood sacrifice because the blood sacrifice has to be God himself. And we know that from Genesis chapter 22, the Akedahs, the Hebrews call it, the blood sacrifice that God accepted in the place of Isaac was himself. And so God had to send his own son into the world. John chapter 3, verse 16. This is what Jesus told uh, Nicodemus when he came to him and said, can, you know, I, how can a man be born again when he's like 50 or 60 years old? And Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so that's why you don't have to pay tithes. That's why you don't have to be sin free and earn your way into heaven. Because if you earn your way into heaven, then Jesus' death on the cross was in vain. If Jesus' death on the cross wasn't good enough, 
to get us into heaven, then he had a blemish. The Passover lamb wasn't acceptable. But if his sacrifice was acceptable to God in total, all we have to do is accept it as a free gift. To try to add anything to that is a rejection of the gift. If you say, no, I'm going to pay a price. Before you give me your $300,000 Lamborghini, I'll give you $470 for it. That's all I have in my bank account right now, you know, the guy says. And that would be an insult to somebody trying to give you a gift of millions of dollars. So if you try to add anything to the gospel of Jesus Christ, which says the blood sacrifice has already been paid and all we have to do is believe, that's the only price of admission, belief upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. If you add anything to that, you've rejected the gospel. You've changed the rules and therefore you can't be saved. Goodness forbid, tomorrow we're gonna to celebrate Resurrection Sunday and we should all be happy about it because that means that we can all exercise our freedom of choice, our free will, and believe upon the Lord Jesus for salvation. And just based upon that alone, without having to do anything else, we get out of hell free. A get out of hell free card was purchased for all of us 2,000 years ago on, ne God bless you man, on Nissan, 14, 32 AD, the get out of hell free card. People are happy about that. I'm glad I don't have to go to hell. I'm glad I get to choose to not go to hell by believing on this guy, Jesus, because 2,000 years ago, on a cross just like this, he paid that price so we don't have to. That's good news. That's why the Bible refers to the whole thing, and that's why little Jack, who's being taught the Bible and about Jesus by Julia, he had to learn about the blood. Like, what's all this, you know, God is love, Jesus is love, kindness, forgiveness, and, but what's all the blood about? The blood is about us being able to escape from the lake of fire, hell forever. You have to pay that price. It's a bloody story. It's a messy story, but it's a good story for us. And it is a historical fact that we can now accept and apply to our lives. That's what makes it good news. Jesus dies and pays the penalty of eternity in hell for us so that we don't have to. That's good news for me. I didn't want to go to hell. I, even as a little kid, I didn't want to go to hell. I still don't want to go to hell. I wouldn't want to be separated from God forever anywhere, but I especially wouldn't want to be separated in a place called the Lake of Fire, which wasn't created for the children of men, sons of Adam, daughters of Eve. It was created for Satan and the fallen angels who rebelled. So, the good news is, tomorrow, he is risen. And because of that, all we have to do is believe, and we can go to the Father's house in heaven. When the rapture occurs, and it may soon, we've talked about the, the, the red heifers and the rebuilding of the temple and all the exciting things that we see going on in everyday news. We see Bible prophecy being fulfilled. That's exciting because it means we're getting closer to that very, very special moment in time that the Bible calls our blessed hope when we are raptured up to the Father's house in heaven to be with the Lord Jesus forever. Jesus told him at that last supper, John chapter 14, verses one, two, and three, I'm going away to my father's house. But if I go away, I'm coming again so I can receive you to myself so that where I am, there you might be also. Not here on earth, but at the father's house in heaven. That's the pre-tribulation rapture that's referred to in 1 Thessalonians chapter four, verses 13 through 18. Paul tells us in great detail, the pre-tribulation rapture is our, quote, blessed hope. After you've become saved by believing on the gospel of Jesus Christ, the very next thing that becomes our blessed hope is for Jesus to come into the clouds, up in the sky, to take us to be with him at his father's house of many mansions. So, with that, Resurrection Sunday is tomorrow before sunrise, not at sunrise. It's not the fertility sun god worship system. The pagans worship the sun as a god. So when it rose above the sea or rose above the horizon, they worshiped it. You know, that's Nimrod. And Easter or Ishtar is really Nimrod's wife, Semiramis, the fertility sky goddess. So we don't want to refer to uh, tomorrow as Easter Sunday. We want to refer to it as Resurrection Sunday. And we don't want to do it at the rising of the sun. That's the sun god worship system. Jesus rose from the dead before the sun arose. When they went to the tomb, at sunrise, it was already empty just before sunrise. So we know that Jesus rose from the dead 2,000 years ago. So just by believing on him, we can have eternal life. That's the good news. We're ending it there. Hopefully, very soon, our blessed hope, now that we believed on Jesus because he rose from the dead, 
will be to be gathered together with him, which is what he told his disciples for the first time at that Last Supper in 32 AD on Nisan 14. He told us that he was going to come into the clouds and gather us all together so that we could be with him, and that would be our blessed hope. So maybe it's sooner than we think. There's a lot of talk about the rebuilding of the temple, and the red heifer has already been reestablished genetically. Maybe soon. Our blessed hope will be fulfilled being caught up in the clouds to meet Jesus in the air. So until then, happy Resurrection Sunday in advance and keep looking up for our redemption draweth nigh.